I feel like we have finally got the band back together. I don't know if we're the cause for this, but to get you four back in a room, it feels pretty special. Welcome, Making Movies, to the Bridge Studios. Thank you. It does feel special. Diego lives in Los Angeles and only comes to Kansas City for special moments like this. Yeah, so... uh, I think one of the the real driving things about making movies right now is you've got a big show coming up December 18th over at the Truman, and you're going to be doing Radiohead's Kid A. That's right. Um, A few years ago, we started playing at the Truman once a year around the holidays, and we had the idea. I think I I got it from a Flaming Lips concert that I think they did a Beatles album from start to finish just randomly at a concert, and then another band, Deer Tick, they do a Deervana where they'll just do a, a Nirvana <laughs> show, like, for no reason. And um, it just sounded fun. So we did a Talking Heads uh, album. Then we did a Clash album. And we were trying to figure out what album we wanted to do this year. And you all chose a Radiohead song for us to cover as part of your 20th anniversary celebration, your birthday party of sorts. And that kind of set us on this this wavelength. We're like, wait a second. we It's kind of fun to play Radiohead with congas and and you know maybe some spanish lyrics and some other stuff happening too well i was kind of curious if you had much of a relationship with music before that project i do yeah i i grew up listening to radiohead quite a bit um I, actually we we all did except for juan carlos juan carlos it's new to juan carlos but duncan uh, has, has been a fan and diego and i listened to it but my my fandom had waned a little bit from from when i was younger not not because i any dislike just just kind of moving on to other things but revisiting the music's been really fun it was um the 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 song that you did for us uh it was like i was kind of surprised how well it all translated i mean it just was like almost magical you know layering you all into the radio head song and i don't know if you felt the same way did you what were your expectations going in (laughs) <laughs> I know Juan Carlos was freaked out because he's heard some Radiohead music. He's like, are we doing Paranoid Android or something? You know, like, I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> a seven-minute long, you know, progressive opus. Um, but then it did both things, right? It was both, it's more of a simpler Radiohead song, the one we did, I Might Be Wrong. Um, in their canon, it's kind of more loopy, almost blues-based, as if blues were aliens or something, because that's what Radiohead sounds like to me. But um, once we dug into it, we realized it was also very layered. And it took a lot of energy and a lot of work. And we we were really happy because um, the danciness that they chase in their kind of computer programming style of creating rhythms is not so dissimilar from the things that we do. We just do it from a more organic, handmade kind of a way. Um, the thing that I loved was that making movies didn't get lost in it. It still sounded like making movies, you know, which was really yeah. great. Yeah, I feel like that's... Um, maybe our strength. It, we we don't know how to not sound like that. You know, one of the things that I also uh, really hate as a consumer is knowing everything that happens in a movie before I go. So, you know, because I've seen the trailers for it. So I know that you all are working on some special things and some surprises for the show, but you're not ready to talk about it yet. So I'm not going to go there, but I do want to tease the fact that you've got some co-conspirators that are likely to be dropping by. That's right. Well, I, what I can speak to is what we've done in the years past, you know, um, at various making movie shows when we've done this, the first time we ever did something like this, we played a making movie set. Then we did a set of protest music that predates the Talking Heads, and then we had everybody from uh, folks in the Elders to the the Nace Brothers and um, and other local musicians. Then in the years to follow, we had Calvin Arsenia join us, um, a rotating cast, Kiana. There's been uh, so many musicians that have joined us on stage in these moments, and it's been super fun. So from Bob Walkenhorse to Kiana, like just a spectrum of Kansas City musicians. Um, and that's really fun for us because it, it's it's like a, it doesn't happen as often as you think it maybe should in a town like this because it's a small small music community, but there's not that often that we all get to share the same stage. So it's fun to do that. We're certainly working on that piece. Right. So, you know, it is special for you to get together and play because we've had so many opportunities taken away. And I I don't know if people realize how hard working a touring band making movies has been in the past. So it'll be good to get you back on stage. You're also signed up for a really huge festival in Mexico City. That's right. Next year, we're we're putting out a new album and 
And uh, we've kind of cracked the nut open for ourselves in Mexico. Um, this, you know, it feels like like a lifetime in the making. I know Juan Carlos, Diego, and I, who've been in the band the longest, we've been dreaming of this moment. And this festival is in March. It's Vive Latino. There's also a couple other festivals we're about to announce. But that's like their Coachella and or, or Bonnaroo or whatever, like a brand like that for their for Mexico and their music scene. So for us, it's really like a coming of age. It's like, oh, we've entered the the big leagues we're the little new guys on the in the big leagues and now we now we gotta we gotta show up it, we don't get a, that many swings in the, in the major leagues you know well it's a it's a festival it's known not only for the breadth of it i mean it's not bound by genre right? that's right and it also has launched careers and it's huge crowds and like i actually counted they they didn't count them for me and there are over 70 bands on the bill for this thing. So it's just an enormous, enormous thing, but you're going to be in front of just a ton of people, you know, and I, I, you know, like in some of the bands that we play here on the bridge are a part of it, Black Pumas, Devendra Banhart, Gary Clark Jr., Milky Chance, Pixies. So it's all over the road. Uh, it is. Have you, have you decided who you want to try and steal a look at while you're there playing it? I've been thinking about it. Well, the Pixies, for sure. I'm a big Pixies fan. There's also an artist from Puerto Rico. He lives in New York now. His name's Residente. And if you all don't know his music, um, that's one that, that I, I feel like I feel like it, it would translate, even if you don't speak Spanish. It's very lyrical, but there's enough of his music in, on YouTube that has translations or something around it. He's really, really poetic. Um, there's all kinds of, like, like Maldita Vencidad is like a punk band from Mexico. Punk, ska thing. I'm excited to see that stuff, because... Mexican audiences, I think Juan Carlos can attest, for that kind of music, they go hard. I mean, they go hard. So I, I can't wait to see just the, the ruckus. We're ready. We're ready to go to Mexico. So we're excited. And I've heard that, that that type of music is a big thread, like maybe the biggest ongoing thread through the down through the years. So Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be cool. Well, you know, here in Kansas City, we can't wait for the 18th and and making movies, playing Radiohead. It's going to adventure, right? Oh, man. And we're ready. This is... I'm I'm a little you know a little nervous. This is the first time we're going to perform a song that we just worked up this week for you all. We'd love to hear some. This is Kid A by Radiohead.
children follow me out of their homes. Making movies today in the Bridge Studios. That was that was fabulous. It just, you know, can we just fast forward to December 18th? I don't want to give up that much life, but I'm ready for it now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so much fun as uh, at the Truman making movies, taking on Radiohead's Kid A. You know, in the last segment, I, I you know, I kind of let it slide by, but I have to ask. Uh, you were talking about the new album. And uh, it's been a while. We're ready for a new album. Uh, and my understanding is you went down and did this one in Memphis. We did. Um, so during the the kind of the weird nebulous stages of the pandemic, we had just started and laid down the foundation for a few tracks um, of the album. And then, you know, we kind of had to pause, like everything in the world paused. But an opportunity arose to enter in this artist residency program in well we didn't officially enter but they had an artist residency like apartments at this organization in memphis that had been closed so we're the we would be the only people that have ever walked in that that's that building so then we felt safe enough to get into our sprinter van and kind of bubble ourselves to memphis get inside of uh, the, these apartments and then just be from there to the recording studio so we created our own little little isolation bubble and cut a record and within that, we learned so much. I mean, we're, we are in love with using music as a way to learn more about ourselves, you know, ourselves, the human race, but ourselves as people, individuals. And Memphis is just like this fertile ground for all that kind of exploration. We met some folks like Deborah Barnes, her kids sing on our record, but she sang with Ray Charles. So she's part of like the old Memphis gospel tradition. She sang in a gospel choir during Martin Luther King's rallies. And we had to got the opportunity to make a make some documentary footage with her. We didn't know that's what we were making. We we were making live stream footage. Yeah. But later it became the documentary. We also got to meet Cedric Burnside, incredible blues guitar player, and a bunch of other folks. And Reverend Hodges, yeah, that's right, who played organ with Al Green. He he played a, on a song on our record, and getting some of that classic American music flavor into an all Spanish record. Uh, I think we created something that that I can confidently say you've never heard before because we'd never heard it before and we've been looking for it. You know, I I, I want to just stop for half a second and and you know it's it's hard to say this without sounding like I in some way doubted you all, right? But that documentary that you did coming out of Memphis was just spectacular stuff really really good and really well put together really high quality and uh, I was just taken with it and I'm I'm kind of a tough audience I don't get taken very easily and so if people uh, have not seen Americana it is still available on our website uh, on the TV side kansascitypbs.org and it is worth the time it's fascinating stuff and I I, you know, it's like to see actual magic happen on TV. And then the, the playing with Cedric Burnside, where it was just sort of like, it felt like uh, the moment where you drop the Mentos into the, into the cola, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's just like whew, first time out and this stuff happens. Yeah. That's the power of music. Um, it's like you can tap into a conversation that, um, though we, we were both, we both knew it. We both knew this language, even though we came at it from different perspectives. And when Juan Carlos and I, I mean, we walked out of that session with goosebumps and just kind of like, like, whoa, something really magical happened. I, I remember, um, pulled into Kansas city after that trip at like four in the morning, something like that, driving home from Memphis and, and, uh, 
dropped one cuddles off at his house and kind of he- heading down to my house, driving through, like getting off I-70 on Prospect. There's just this big white owl just staring at me at a stoplight. And so even though I was really tired and really want to go to bed, I just pulled over and hung out with it and then <laughs> and then made my way back home. And I it just, it felt like um, in that moment, the things we were learning, like some ancestor had flown down and was just kind of giving me a thumbs up, like you're on the you're on the path. Continue. And I'm just so glad that the documentary was happened because when you have something magical like that to repurpose it to help other people find it is such a good idea. And I was so glad that I watched it. And so, again, can't recommend that highly enough. You talked about growing as people through the experience, and of course, your albums um, have so often had. Um, like stories and ideas behind them. And I don't want to spoil anything, but is this another album like that with a narrative to go along with? I I have to apologize and say, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I guess I don't know how to do it another way, but um, (laughs) it is, but it's, it's uh, more autobiographical than before. It's the story of a, of a group of young men coming, coming of age through music and, um, in a way, it's our story and, and, and my personal story, but um, there's a little bit of uh, a fiction thrown in there. There's a little bit of magic in the story. Well, you know, when I have gone back and looked at, you know, these things as bodies of work, it almost feels like Latin alternative opera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which I don't know if anybody's ever used that phrase. I should, you know, trademark it immediately um, and drive it into the ground. But it does feel like that, right? There's a story going on through it. So thank you. Can't wait to find uh, find out what this one's all about. Uh, and you talked about the collaborations. Uh, and I guess in the past, you've worked so strongly with Steve Berlin. Uh, and I guess he was a, a small part of this, but you're working with a different producer this time. Yeah, we, I mean, it was really just due to the pandemic. Steve and I were talking about making this record together, but a little different having Steve fly down from Portland to meet us than it, it was for, for us to to kind of go to Memphis. And Diego made the trips when it was appropriate and when it didn't make sense um, or felt too dangerous, he didn't. So it was like logistically, we just didn't work with Steve. He He helped co-write a song on the album. And, and that was really, really fun. Um, we did some of that stuff virtually um, when we were recording this, a song called La Sombra. But um, this step forward was just us and our manager, who's a producer as well. That's kind of what brought him into music is he loves production and, and being an artist. And then learned that, you know, learned how to manage because of that love. But um, it made it feel like it was uh, a chance to re- reform an identity, on you know, kind of like take off the training wheels. I realized that I had deferred to Steve a lot on decision making. I would let him choose what songs made the record. I, I, I trusted him enough to just throw a pile of songs on him, and he'd basically tell me, "Not this one, that one, this one, this one." Cool. Well, oh, drop my pick. But um, the this time that was on us, and I think that it made us have to be a little more brave. And it was good. It was good for us to to have more responsibility like that. Nobody walks into this room and says, yeah, you know, I kind of like the last record more. (laughs) 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 That doesn't happen. Uh, But it's like when you all talk about this record and how excited you are, there's a glint in your eye. I think everybody kind of feels like this is this is another step forward. It really it really feels like that. Um, I I feel like I've been changed. You know, I mean. The pandemic rocked everybody's world, and it was scary, but good for me in a in a way to have to reassess what the why on everything. It's like, what is a rock and roll band if you can't play shows? If you just do Zoom call band meetings, and you're just talking about what? If you're not actually going to get together and do the thing that brought you together. So we all had to kind of like look at that in the face and say, what does it mean to be banded together? And and then. The documentary is like the the most clear output of what it means for us to band together on something is that there's a higher reason for why we do this. Therefore, no matter where the winds blow us, um, we have a sense of grounded identity within it and a sense of purpose. And when you're in when you're really busy, you sometimes don't know if you have that. And it was good to feel like, oh, you know what, we we do have that. And this is valuable to us in spite of it, you know, 
there being no work to do in a traditional sense, this still has value. And I think that that glued us together and gives us the spirit to carry on another 12 years. It's been a 12 year journey now. Uh -huh. You know, I, I don't want to ask this next question because, uh, you know, these things are likely to change. And my understanding is that Taylor Swift and Adele have used up all of the vinyl on the planet. And so, <laughs> and so everybody's getting pushed back, but when are we at least tentatively going to get some of this new music? Cause that's what everybody wants to know is when can I get it? Early next year. So, you know, in the, in the early spring or late winter, we'll start dropping singles. We're making another music video here in Kansas City. We've made two others, and uh, we're going to start sharing all that work with you all. All right. We cannot wait. Thank and, you. of course, the show is coming up December 18th at the Truman Making Movies, taking on Radiohead's Kid A. And we'd love to hear some more music if we could. Absolutely. In Latin America, the blues, I think the bluesiest music is called cumbia. And uh, it's big rhythm in Panama, Colombia, Mexico, all over the world now. This is a making movies cumbia called La Marcha. Marcha on the bridge. You know, that song uh, really dates back to around the beginnings of the band, right? I mean, it was like 10 years old. That's right. That song's about 10 years old. You know, I, one of the things that I love about making movies is the collaborative nature. And we've already 
like, you know, it almost sounds like name dropping, right? All the people we've already mentioned during this interview, but you're in Austin and you're playing a gig there and you run into Jim Eno of Spoon. That's right. Uh, Steve Berlin invited him. It wasn't like uh, completely... Well, I, There's I, a I, need start, I need to start working out because I'm a little out of breath. Um, <laughs> th- th- he invited Jimino to the show, and uh, Jimino fell in love with the band, and um, we started talking about doing some stuff together. So he mixed that song for us. That's pretty special stuff. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. he's dope, and he has an amazing studio in Austin that we want to we want to cut a record there someday soon. You know, the the thing that, as long as we're talking about all these collaborations, I mean, you had to be excited as we record this. It was only last night that Ruben Blades was named Person of the Year at the Latin Grammys for 2021. That's right. Which is such an honor um, as a Panamanian, as, a, as somebody who's admired him for years, to have the opportunity to work with him. We just got a text that the song, we, uh, another song that we did with him, Note Calles, they aired a little bit during during the uh, celebration of his honor. I got a text from our friends in Florida, Toloache, they were there. It's like, oh my God, I only got the end, but look. So we were on the big screen for a split second in some of that celebration. Yeah, you know, I, it's it's. I think it's hard to express to people who aren't a part of your world or that, that or the, you have multiple worlds, right? But the Latin world, how much, how important Ruben Blades is. Um, but I think that one of the telling things is not only was he named the person of the year, but he also won album of the year and best salsa album. Now, you know, m- most of the world, the music business belongs to the young. He's 73 years old and he's still winning award after award after award. It's really remarkable. It is because he's a, he's a person of, of, uh, of character and, um, He's made his art matter, you know, because he has focused it on the right, the right desired outcomes. I, I don't know how to describe that super well, but his counsel for us, I think it's like we we had just played in Mexico City with him at the Auditorio Nacional, which is why we're getting these big festivals, because that's like the Kennedy Center for Mexico. He brought us and he, and he brought us to his press junket and he told all the people who showed up to talk to him because he's a legend these people are important. It was the words out of his mouth. He said, they were important before I met them and they will be important after I stopped collaborating with them. And that opened the door for Mexico and he did that intentionally for us. And so we're riding high off that, off having our song nominated for a Latin Grammy through his album. And, you know, they, Ricky Martin introduces it, plays on the big screen. He didn't win, but that's okay. He won this year. <laughs> um, this song, No Te Calles, that we did with him. And then 2020 starts and everything shuts down. And I, I think that I hadn't really thought about this, but maybe that sense of identity and focus came from having the pause that allowed me to soak up and let it sink in the things we'd learned from him. One of the last things we did before the pandemic shut down was we went to New York City and he took us out to lunch and he, he wanted to meet with us. And it was uncanny that he like was, we were in the van ride, just kind of talking about the issues that we were having, the challenges. And it was like, as if he had been in the van, he was answering the questions we were asking. It was trippy like that. He said, I want to meet with you. I'm busy, but I can do lunch. Come here. He sat and talked with us for two hours. And I wrote down a lot of notes that day. And um, I think perhaps this break allowed us all to absorb that information. And those messages that he was communicating to us are why I believe that at 73, his music is still resonating and regenerating because it was never about him. It was about trying to elevate things. And I think that's what he was trying to teach us through this. You know, it wasn't just, and uh, hopefully you'll forgive my pronunciation, but no take Caius. Uh, he also collaborated with you on Delilah. That's right. And that's a song that he co-wrote with Lou Reed, which is just sort of like, okay, push me over with a feather. I mean, you know, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's beyond cool. I mean, it's just a shocking thing. And then I I think that that really in a way, like the, the meaningful part also in a way, the sad part is that that song, which was clearly written a very long time ago, um, has just, was just never as, it was never more important than it was in the moment that you guys presented it. Um, 
and I, I've thought a lot about that song and, and what it means to you because I don't have some of the things that you have faced. You and your brother Diego even had different immigration statuses. This has been a very real thing for you. And so to be not only gifted this song from Two Legends, but also to have it be something that I won't put words in your mouth, but clearly has to be a part of the dynamic of your life from birth. Yeah, it, it has been. I mean, our families are immigrant families. And even here in Kansas City, we have friends with different statuses that have had different challenges, um, uh, some pretty, pretty gut wrenching. And it's just it's silly that that we make we may we make a world where we can keep people separated by these strange lines that we draw on the sand saying this is ours and that's theirs. Um, I know there's some necessity to all that. I don't have the answer, but I think it's we need to raise the question on why and how we can do better. You know, the pandemic, I think, really threw a lot of folks for a loop. You took it as an opportunity to go back in and sort of invest even further into your not-for-profit art as mentorship. And you've been doing some pretty exciting things. You want to talk about the studio? That's right. Yeah, we built a studio for young artists to develop their career. And it's a, it's a studio where you you can't rent it. We say that curiosity is the currency. So you you have to be a part of the program or you'd be volunteering for the program, but it's a state of the art space in downtown Lillian Park. And then we're also moving into programming space on the east side in Kansas City. 2022 will be the biggest year in our ability to impact kids. There's a whole team built around this work. And I'm really, really proud of that. And you recently had your first session with some kids in that studio. This week. It got yeah. wired up and the Electric Cherry Bombs, a band that formed <laughs> at our music camp, was in there writing a recording an original song. That's really great. What was the reaction of those kids to be in a functioning studio? Oh, they loved it. They were amazed. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, so the... Um, I know that you're planning every year, you are sort of gear up and run another program. So we'll find out more uh, in January. Uh, but this is a not-for-profit and not-for-profits don't exist without support. So if there's a, if an angel were to descend, if an angel happens to be listening or watching, uh, what's the thing that you want to do next that you haven't found the ways and the means to do? I wanna have a link between inner city and suburban communities with young people and that requires uh, resources because you need a maybe to purchase a shuttle or have a shuttle agreement you need the staffing you need to have the safety precautions the insurance so that inner city kids and suburban kids start to build bonds over music because those are different cultures they're different ethnicities often but sometimes they're not they're just different cultures in our own community if somebody could help us do that in 2022 we're, we're, we're ready to make it happen. We just need a little bit more resources. Well, you know, I'm so proud of you guys, everything that you've done. It's been an amazing gift to the city as if the music hasn't already been enough. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And we're super excited too about just purely like, you know, from a personal uh, entertainment greed standpoint, December 18th at the Truman, it's going to be, it's going to be a party. It's going to be joyous. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, as making movies takes on Radiohead's Kid A. We'd love to hear another song if we could. Yeah, this song's Delilah.
Look like fun. That was fun. That was, that was fun. fun. Yeah, those big chords. I love that. That's uh, that's so good. Well, Enrique, Juan Carlos, Duncan, Diego, thank you so much for coming in. Can't wait to see you December eighteenth over at the Truman doing Radiohead's uh, Radiohead's Kid A. You're also doing other stuff uh, in that show besides that as well. Yeah, we'll do a set of our own music. We also have two local op- well, two openers, one from Memphis, one from Kansas City that are going to open the show. We'll do our own set, and then we'll come back out as a super group augmented by a few amazing local musicians to take on that album, Kid A, and play it front to back and spend some time with that music. But we're going to play it as if it was a party album. It's not, (laughs) but it will be on December 18th. Making movies December 18th at the Truman, and hopefully in February, new music. And so I have the sense that we'll be talking to you all again soon. Oh, I can't wait. Making movies today on the bridge. Thanks, guys. Thank you, John.